Hey folks, this is uh, me back again with another vlog. This is um, Star vs. the Forces of Evil, uh, Season 1, Episode 6, Muberty and Pixtopia. And uh, just like Episode 5, this is another pair of segments that work really well uh, as a unit. Um, you know, there's, there's a thematic resonance between them that makes them easy to connect. I like that. I'm wondering if that's something the show's going to keep doing moving forward, because that's pretty cool if so. Uh, it's not something you often see in these, you know, kind of segmented cartoon shows. Um, you know, usually either they'll do two completely unrelated segments, or they'll do, like, a one story that's double the length, possibly divided into segments or not. Actually, most of the things, uh, most of the segmented half-hour cartoons I'm familiar with are three segments, uh, and those also uh, usually either no thematic connection whatsoever, or they would just have one long episode um, as like a special thing. But here, uh, like we've had two episodes in a row where there's been this strong thematic connection between the two pieces, and I'm wondering if that's intentional and something they'll keep doing. Anyway, that, that connection was the, this idea of, um, puberty, growing up, and, like, sexual and romantic interest. Um, and... So, first episode, uh, Muberty. Uh, it was, you know, comedic, wacky, alien puberty, you know, taking, you know, puberty, which is, you know, this anxious time where a person's body changes in strange ways, and, you know, just taking that and turning it into this silly thing that allows them to play with alien biology. And so... Star, you know, sprouts little purple hearts instead of pimples, but then she starts sprouting enormous numbers of them, and they turn into a cocoon, and she turns into this weird insect creature. Uh, and then at the end, she has vestigial wings. All cute. Um, the main thing I like about it, um, well, there's a thing I liked and a thing I didn't like. Uh, one is the way it focused on, uh, like, it equated puberty to the sex drive, which, yes, for many people, the sex drive does kind of increase a great deal during puberty, though I seem to recall reading studies that that's mostly only true for boys, for girls, uh, who, for many girls, it continues growing throughout life. Though, given that the studies I'm talking about are quite old and acted as if everyone has a sex drive and just divided into categories boys and girls, I don't know how much credence it holds anymore. You know, if, if it's been superseded by more accurate research since then, uh, that wasn't saddled by, you know, baseless assumptions about how to categorize people. That aside, uh, that is one of my issues, is that it equates uh, sexuality with puberty, because, you know, asexual people exist, uh, not all attraction is, you know, heterosexual. It was very, uh, both segments were very heteronormative in the way they dealt with uh, attraction, though with maybe a little bit uh, of playing with it in the second segment, but I'll get to that. Um, and I also, uh, you know, it's definitely readable as the typical girl goes boy crazy thing, you know, uh, which is a thing, uh, and, you know, it's always treated kind of comedically as if it's less than where the desires of a boy are taken much more seriously, um, Sort of like how Diaz's crush on 
a girl whose name I'm blanking on. She's got like a hyphenated first name. I can't remember her name. Uh, but like how his crush is treated, uh, not seriously, nothing in this show is treated seriously, but it's treated as legitimate. Whereas Star's uh, attraction to every boy in sight is treated as silly, but at the same time, I, I feel like it's still kind of given the same treatment as a boy of that age would be, in the sense that it's, you know, she's just awash with hormones uh, and more or less wants to rub up on every boy she sees. And it's very much the kind of behavior that gets the boys will be boys treatment. You know, the assumption that all boys are, you know, all boys of that age are horn dogs, and girls, you know, carefully dole out sexual favors and some kind of power play. Utter nonsense. But it's a very pervasive idea in our culture. And, I mean, it's just not true. And I like that this episode isn't bothering to try to claim that. You know, that Star is just, you know, Star is just full of the hormones and the sex drive. And, you know, it's treated comedically, but it's still treated as being basically legit. Um, it's a thing that she's allowed to have, and it's a stage she passes through. And I see no reason to think that, like, her crush on Oscar will automatically go away. I'm so curious why Oscar is always drawn with fangs. Is he, like, a vampire or something? I mean, I know he sits out in daylight, but in some versions of vampires, they can do that. In the novel Dracula, he could go around in daylight just fine. It's just that daylight was... If I remember correctly, he could only be killed during the day. And a bunch of other requirements. Uh... But it didn't, like... I think it weakened him a little, but it didn't kill him. Uh, that aside. Mm, it was a fun episode. It was creative. I really liked, like, the horror movie aspects to it. Though, again, I feel like there's a, ne a very negative read of this that could be easily reached for. That, you know, oh, you know, that, that female desire is this alien thing. That it's wrong, that it's, you know, scary, uh, where male desire is depicted as normal. But I don't think it's there. And one of the reasons is I definitely read Jana as being interested in Diaz. And so there's an attraction of a girl toward a boy being depicted as normal. And also because we've got the second episode still to come. Um... Where So let's talk about the second episode, which this was um, kind of dealing with two different stories. One involving Fernando, is that his name? Um, Ferdinand or Fernando? I can't remember. I'm going to go with Fernando. Um, Ferguson? Ferguson, I think that's his name. That's, that's what I'm going to call him anyway, uh, for at least this vlog. Ferguson... Uh, does not... So there's Ferguson's story, and then there's everybody else's story. So I'm going to start with everybody else's story. Um, basically, racked up a high cell phone bill, so they have to go pay it. The necessity of paying the bill leads them into having to slave in this dungeon. And then, you know, shenanigans ensue. And really, this is a story, you know, just like the previous one was a story about anxiety about puberty, this is a story about anxiety about growing up. Because, you know, having to work at a terrible job in order to pay your bills uh, for a boss that's a jerk, getting stuck with, ar you know, arbitrary bureaucratic rules that trip you up. Uh, these are all major features of adulthood uh, in our society. And they're definitely things that are worth being afraid of. So, because they suck. Um, so, yeah. That was all there. But the more interesting part to me was uh, Ferguson's story. Um, because, yeah, I definitely got the idea that the uh, Pixie Empress wanted to eat him. And that she was going through all this stuff 
uh, you know, that it was um, set him up as the sacrificial king kind of a thing, uh, the corn king kind of a thing, where he's feted and fed and given every luxury and married to the empress, and then in the morning they sacrifice him. In this case, eat him. But I don't think that's the case. Um, certainly Star does. Star says she wants to eat him. But I don't think so, because she then turns around and marries Armando. Um, and he's talking about becoming the Pixie King, and we end on him talking about how he's going to be all tyrannical. And there's no indication of him needing a rescue. And... I mean, yeah, the, the terms in which she described Ferguson, you know, as delicious, uh, and how he has all this excess skin, um, yeah, could definitely be read as her wanting to eat him. That's certainly how I, I was initially reading it, but I don't know. I just feel like uh, the episode would not have left Armando there to be eaten. Um, and... Why go through with the wedding ceremony if you're going to eat him? I mean, I know the Corn King thing I was just talking about, but I don't know. I just feel like I think in concert with the previous episode particularly, I think it's saying that, no, you know, the queen was interested in uh, Ferguson. She was, as she said, into him. Mm, because, you know, again, that, that you know, it makes all of episode six kind of about female desire, and about, in particular, that women want what they want and who they want, just like, you know, anybody else wants what they want and who they want. Um, you know, the queen... I think was genuinely attracted to uh, first Ferguson and then Armando. You know, maybe she likes large men. And from her perspective, they're both very large men. Um, maybe she's got a human fetish. You know, who knows what it is about them? You know, it could be any of a bajillion things. She could be attracted to completely different things in each of them. Um, I don't, it doesn't matter. You know, the point is they talk about it being Ferguson's one chance at love, but it's not. Um, I'll admit to being kind of squicked out by the masturbation joke uh, when he takes the little statuette of the queen uh, off the cake and says he's saving it for later. Uh, I'm sure kids in the audience, you know, probably assume that he was going to eat it. Um, but no. He's gonna go home and jack off over a statuette of his ex, which, um, no, that's disgusting. Uh, I mean, nothing wrong with masturbation, but, um, don't steal images of real people and then, hmm. Uh, uh, that's really gross. Um, because, like, it's hard to imagine anything more objectifying, isn't it? Like, you're literally reducing the person to an object that you're going to masturbate over. That's just... Ugh. I mean, again, nothing wrong with porn, but... The assumption is that porn is voluntary. You know, this this was he stole. But I mean, that is you know it is what it is. Mm, it's anyway, that aside, uh the one joke I did really like was uh, the little song that Armando and Ferguson sang about uh teenage boys holding hands. Because, um, thank you, yes, one brief moment that at least wasn't completely heteronormative. I know we can't expect much more than that from Disney Channel. 
Um, but that one brief moment, uh, thank you, in this, like, entire episode. And, you know, I guess I've probably made it seem, because I've been kind of, you know, talking a lot about what I didn't like, uh, that I didn't care for this episode, but, you know, I did. I actually did. Um, the things I liked, I liked enough to make up for the things I didn't like. Mm, and then some. Now, this was good. This was good. Um... I hope we get more episodes that, you know, work thematically like this, where the two segments reflect one another. Um, and, you know, I hope the show continues to be this good or better. So far, so good. Um, we're six episodes in, and there hasn't been any, like, total howlers, I'm um, liking the show. So, yeah. Thanks as always, and see you next time. Bye.